whether you are newer to the Christian faith here, brand new, maybe you're not a believer yet, you're like, I'm not even sure I'd call myself a Christian yet, or you're a veteran Christian, you read the Bible for years, lots of familiarity, lots of familiarity with it, and one of the things we revel in here at our church, we love challenging, answering questions, uh, asking questions, inquiring about the Bible. We are not afraid of one verse, one passage, one topic. Nothing is off limits. And we glory in it. We believe that it honors God for us to not go, whoa, 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 we can't talk about that one. Nope. Jesus said even the things that were in secret can be, will be shouted from the rooftops. The principle is that there isn't anything in his word that he goes, don't read this to people. Nope. You got questions, you come ask them. There are plenty of things that we might not know, we may not understand fully, but there is nothing that's off the table for inquiry. And you and I need God's help. There are many things in the Bible that no amount of meditation, no amount of study, no amount of deep thinking will solve. You need him. You need him. There's a practice a, uh, a, a tool that the Lord, I believe, has given to the church that we call apologetics. Apologetics. It actually comes from a Greek term, apologia, which means defense, to provide a defense, an intellectual answer for a challenge or a question. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us that this is something that we should have as a tool in our belts. Always be prepared to give an answer to those who are asking for the hope. Uh, for the reason for the hope we have in Jesus. And so we should be prepared to do this. It can be an awesome and a wonderful, helpful thing in many ways. But we do not rely on intellectual arguments as the ultimate solution to the big philosophical and spiritual questions that the Bible proposes. This is why not one single soul in all of human history has been argued into salvation. Oh, great, you answered that final question. Deal, where do I sign? Not one. Regarding spiritual things, the ultimate cure to cognitive or mental misunderstanding is not cognitive understanding. It's faith in Jesus. That's the cure. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, the natural person, this means a person in their flesh, this is either the fleshly side of a believer, okay, or this is someone who's not yet a believer, they don't yet have the spirit of God in them, a natural state person apart from any help from God, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Hear that? Now, some people call this a cop-out. It is only a cop-out if it's not true. You need the concept of numbers to understand mathematics. You need matter to understand physics, and you need the Spirit of God to understand spiritual things. It's not that hard. Apologetics does serve us well. And here's at least one way. Sound thinking and hard study will inevitably demonstrate that the Christian worldview is the most rationally stable explanation for reality that exists. So don't think for a moment that I'm saying Christian claims are not rational. No, I'm saying that won't ultimately satisfy you. We are even told in 1 Peter 3, 15, to make a defense of the Christian faith, but I want you to notice something. Go ahead and put that slide up. Look at 1 Peter 3.15 where that exact thing is talked about. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. But what precedes the defense? In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. You see? That's the start. And apart from that, no amount of challenging thinking and number crunching will satisfy. There are challenging teachings in the Bible. And first and foremost, you need the Spirit of God. You need faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, it's what you need. But even for the believer... Even for the one who has placed their faith in Jesus, 
there are still things that are hard to understand, hard to navigate. And we'll see that it's not only the stubborn Jews, it's not only the half-hearted or lukewarm disciples that struggle with this. The most committed disciples of Jesus are just as confused as everybody else. But they stay. Why? I'm just going to read this to you. This is a sneak peek of next week too. John 6, 68 and 69. It comes in a couple of verses after where we've been. This is Peter replying when Jesus goes, are you going to leave with the rest? And Jesus, or Peter replies, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? All of this makes sense to us. What's the matter with these people? It's not that hard. No, no, that's not, that's not what he said. You have the words of eternal life. And we've believed, and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You catch it? You see, Peter did not go, oh, we get this. (laughs) That wasn't hard. All this makes sense. That is not what Peter says. He says, we know you. We believe in you. We trust in you. To whom else could we go? You know, there are many things that I teach my kids that they don't understand, but they trust me. And it's on that trust in me that they rely at their age. Just a couple of nights ago, it was actually uh, it was the Friday night before the men's um, breakfast a couple weeks ago. And I was doing Bible reading time with my kids, and uh, Kayla is five years old, and um, she's starting to internalize some of these truths that she's just kind of heard set over her for a long time. And so we get to the, uh, the passage in the Bible um, where Jesus heals somebody. And uh, I said something about like, well, his father sent him to, to do healing. That's one of the things he wanted them to do. And all of a sudden, and she's heard me talk about Jesus as the son and the father. She's heard this a hundred times in her life, okay? Something clicked and she goes, Jesus has a father? And I was like, well, well yeah, Jesus has a father. And he, who, God, Father God, and he's the son. And she goes, but Jesus is God. And I go, well, yeah, the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. I kid you not, she burst into angry tears. That doesn't make any sense. And she lost it. She lost it. And I was like, whoa, whoa here. I turned to my other kids. I was asking uh, my older one, Bethany, Bethany, who is Jesus? And she says, God's only son. He's not a son. He's God. And I was like, okay, we have a lot to unpack here in the Sanford household. We're making heretics in our house at this, at this at not just at this juncture. Don't judge. We've got more work to do. Is that not how you felt on occasion? Have you ever had that? We've read through a text and you go, wait, 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 wait a minute. What? What's the solution? Honey, you're not smart enough yet. You need more books and study and more age and experience. And then finally, no, you know what what the solution is? The solution is to remember who Jesus is. Have faith in Jesus. Have trust in him. You need a high view of God in your life. You need a high view of him as you go to the word. A high view as you walk through life expecting the struggles that you're going to encounter and the challenges that make no sense to you. But he said it. It's it's probably in the top five favorite Old Testament stories. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5. It's during the days of the prophet Elisha. And there's a, there's a commander of the Syrian army. These are enemies of Israel. He's a, he's a, he's a, a high-level general, and he uh, contracts leprosy. And because he's enemies with Israel, he's already raided in Israel's land, and he's stolen people back to include a slave girl, Israelite slave girl, who works for his wife. And this sweet little girl says to him, if only you could go to Israel where there's a real prophet of the living God you could be healed. And so he goes to his king and he tells the king of Syria, he says, send a letter. I want to go and get healed from the Israelites. Well, they're our enemies. Yeah, I know. Please do it. The king writes a letter, sends it to the king of Israel. 
king of Israel opens his mail and, and, and he hears, the general of all my armies is coming, heal him. So what does he think? Surely these guys are picking a fight with me. What are they thinking? Elisha is a true prophet of God. He hears about this and sends word and says, I've got this. Send him to me. So Naaman goes to meet Elisha, and I'll spare you all of the breakdown and all of the details of this, but Elisha uh, sends communication to Naaman, and he says, if you want to be healed of leprosy, go to the Jordan River and dip yourself in it seven times, and then you'll be healed. Does Naaman understand? No. Oh, he actually gets angry. He goes, not only did the guy not show up and talk to me face to face, like something as important as my life. But he sends me to go dip in this dirty old river. We have better rivers back where I'm from. The problem is not dirt, man. The problem is leprosy. I'm going to die. Luckily, one of his servants steps up and says, Sir, if there's even a chance, wouldn't, wouldn't you do it if it was a big thing? This is a little thing. You can get in the water. Go. And so he does. He reluctantly goes. And what happens when he dips himself in the water? Without any understanding at all, this guy, we have full reason to expect that he's doubting. Yeah, let's see if this works. One, two, three. I mean, honestly, as you're trying to picture that, he's probably, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And gets out the seventh time and clean, clear, healed. For the record, if anybody ever tells you the reason you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith, show them stories like this, where even dead people who have no faith can be healed, okay? Here's name and getting out of the water and going... And a change happens in, in him that day. He puts his faith in the true God of Israel over the false gods from Syria. Now, why are stories like this in the Bible? Why are they in there for us? So that as believers, we can continue to be encouraged and be given examples of even when you don't understand, even when it makes no sense to you, trust in the Lord. Do what he says. He knows what he's doing. And you have to hear this because this is not just those things that a few small percentage points of Christians deal with on a rare occasion. No, all of us, this is stock in trade Christian life. You're going to have moments and days and seasons in your life where you're going to have no idea what you're supposed to do. You're going to feel the Lord put something on your heart to go and do, and you're going to feel like, how can that solve this problem? How can that fix this mess? How can this get me out of this situation? And what does the Bible tell us to do? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And that's the easy part of the verse. Because the hard part comes next. And lean not on your own understanding. That's the hard part of it. Struggles are certain. And whenever you encounter a hard teaching, a hard command... It is training that you will need to bolster your faith for whatever God has next. Jesus even taught us to pray, not my will, but yours be done. And this is exactly why. There are going to be plenty of times in your life that something's not going to click. You're not going to get that yet. And he's going to command to move forward anyway. You know, sometimes God does give understanding to difficult things later. This happens. This probably happened for you if you've studied the Bible, spent any time there at all. Things that didn't make sense to you before maybe do make sense to you now. Sometimes the understanding comes later and sometimes it will come much, 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 much later after you and I have gone to see the Lord face to face. But let us take as an example from these people to not do, to be warned from looking at Jesus, hearing something that doesn't compute and throwing our hands up and turning away. As believers, lean in. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding.